S26.1 burst testing, booster 10 engine installation, ship 26 static fire testing approaching, and hot stage ring removal from B9. We'll talk about that and more today in episode 18 of our Starbase flyover update brought to you by RGV Aerial Photography. Diving right into Massey's, here's what it looked like last week on Thursday, September 14th. Now sliding over to the photo taken this week on Wednesday, September 20th to compare the changes. Here's a map layout of the various facilities and pads located within Massey's test site. Shout out to Procky for creating this awesome map. Our first look is at the Booster Cryogenic Testing Station, where the cryo stand doubling as a puck shucker was missing at the time of the flyover as it was busy delivering B10 to the build site. More on that later. The stand was later moved back here overnight Wednesday into Thursday. Looking down, we see the ship puck shucker, which was moved to the build site early Thursday morning after the return of the booster stand. Ship 29 would come back on this stand late Thursday evening for its round of testing. This rollout was captured by our very own RGV cam. Moving down the image, we see that several rows of trenches have been dug, with pipework laid within them near the entrance of Massey's. This appears to be a leach field for a septic tank that could support the nearby staff trailer and maybe even the new building going up nearby. Moving up to the left, it appears road base has been laid next to the tank farm, and it looks like it's already in use by these cryogenic tankers bringing in LN2 or locks to the horizontal storage tanks. This might not be the final form of the road though, as we might see concrete be poured over the gravel or asphalt to make a proper road. Over here sits S26.1. At the time of the flyover, we saw this crowd line connected to the article, as well as these black straps connecting the top of the dome to the ring to prevent it from popping off. After all, we don't want a repeat of what happened to Mark 1 test article back in 2019, which was almost 4 years ago. Can you believe that? Indeed, just as we speculated in the sneak peek, the S26.1 test article was cryogenically tested to destruction just one day after this picture was taken, on the afternoon of Thursday, September 21st. Thanks to Lab Padre for providing this footage. So, why did this test even happen? Why test S26.1 to failure in the first place? Well, the reason is, we're not really sure, to be honest. We first spotted Test Tank 13, as it was called back in 2022, in the Star Factory. It was used to structurally verify the aft section stringer layout around the dome modes that were also featured on S24 and S25. This was important for S24, especially since it was the first to fly back in April. Later on, the bottom 1.5 rings were cut off and outfitted with a plethora of stringers for use in the hot stage ring testing seen at the top in this render by the space engineer. Overall, this was mostly a standard ship aft dome section made it with a test tank forward section. Any data is good data at the end of the day, and who doesn't enjoy a cryogenic explosion? Our very last stop in this week's tour of Massey's is going to be at the very back, where excavators are busy clearing land in the groundwork preparation for the foundations of whichever new building is due to be constructed here. What do you think will happen here? Could they be expanding the water treatment setup? Let me know in the comment section down below. This new construction area is in addition to this other building, which hasn't progressed much since last week other than some more steel being staged around it. Well, that's it for our tour of Massey's. Let's see what's going on at Sanchez. Welcome to Sanchez, where some interesting ground features were discovered this week. Here's a map to help you with identification of the different areas. Before getting started at Sanchez, here's a picture from the flyover we performed on Thursday, September 14th. Now sliding over to this picture from Wednesday, September 20th to compare the changes. There hasn't been much change at the ground fab building this week, so we'll start over at the new stands by the west entrance. Much like last week, there isn't much visible change for any of the three stands currently being built but we have spotted some familiar parts on the ground next to the most complete stand. These are the extension arms that connect through the table and support the weight of the vehicle. Clamps are attached to the end of these arms for holding on to the aft section. Moving up next to the mud flats, we can see crews tearing up the area formerly used for construction of the OLIT sections. If you watched our sneak peek, we mentioned the possibility of this being used for additional rocket garden space. It might be premature to make the prediction, but with the lofty goal SpaceX has for ships and booster production, plus Star Factory coming online in 2024, additional capacity for storage would definitely be needed. Just above this area, we can see more groundwork being done. This is looking more complete than the other location, but due to the close proximity to the structures near the LNG power plant creating a narrow pathway for access, we don't anticipate this being turned into a ship or booster parking spots. We know SpaceX is always looking for additional storage locations for inventory, so don't expect this to be vacant very long. 
or maybe it's all an effort to expand the rollout path from the garden to Highway 4. Down next to a new stand construction area, we can see what looks like even more staircase sections being built in the same area as those for the OLIT a few weeks ago. We thought they were done after reaching the level as the ship QD's arm, but could it be that they're adding stairs all the way up to the top of the tower? It appears so. Nearby, did you notice the fresh markings on this path? It looks like crews brought in a sweeper and laid down some fresh paint to make it look more like an official road. We can see bike lanes exist in both directions. Bikes are more popular than you think at Starbase. Before moving over towards Omega Base, we can see this booster stand that showed up here last week. This was caught by our very own RGV cam. This stand moved from the old tracking station area to Sanchez around midnight of the 16th. This is an older stand that has been stored for several months. Could it be on its way to scrapping? Up next to Rocket Garden, it looks like more digging has been done yet again. Looking at the spools of electrical cable waiting on the right side, it's likely they needed access to vaults in this area for ease of distribution. To wrap up Sanchez, we'll touch on these pieces next to the new mega bay that were mentioned in the sneak peek video. These appear to be steel columns that will form the elevator shafts in the back corners of the new bay. We'll see more of these staged next to Mega Bay 1 when we get over to the build site. Let's head that direction now to check out Star Factory and Mega Bay 2 progress. Next up is the build site, the ever-growing heart of Starbase. Here's a map layout of the site. Before we check out the progress, here's a picture from the flyover that occurred Thursday, September 14th, followed by a more current picture from Wednesday, September 20th to compare the changes. As always, we'll start off with a look at Mega Bay 2, where the giant LR11000 crane continues to lift the individual steel roof beams into place for installation. Switching to this angled shot for a better view, the aforementioned crane looks to have just finished lifting the first piece of corrugated plating. This will support the concrete floor for Mega Bay's 2 office space. Can you imagine working here? Looking down on this image, just behind the crane we notice the four bridge crane beams are still waiting to be installed and still no sign of the carriages that contain the crane hoist. Next up, we switch to this image to get a better look at Mega Bay 1 and the High Bay. Dead center in the middle of Mega Bay 1, we can see Booster 10, which recently returned to Mega Bay 1 in the early morning hours of the 20th following its test campaign at Massey's. Special thanks to all of our RGV cam operators as they were able to catch Booster 10's return from Massey's. Shortly after this flyover, B10 would be lifted onto the new stand we saw installed in the back left corner of Mega Bay 1 for engine installation. And can you believe this? There's not one, not two, but three other boosters currently inside the Mega Bay. Alongside B10 are boosters 11, 12, and 13, which is currently 16 out of 24 rings tall. Each one occupies a separate corner of the Mega Bay. That being said, it shouldn't be much longer before we see B11 come out for its crowd campaign at Massey's. In case you missed it in a previous episode, this newly completed Raptor engine installation stand is used to install all 33 Raptor engines onto the boosters while inside the Mega Bay, as opposed to using the old stand which required engine installation in a particular order and prevented access to the center engines. Big thanks to Chrome Kiwi for creating this render. Just outside Mega Bay 1, in the spot formerly used for staging the staircase sections waiting for installation inside Mega Bay 2, we can see more of the vertical elevator shaft sections waiting for installation in the back corners of the new bay. Moving to the left, we see the high bay, which was home to ships 29, 30, and 31 at the time of this flyover. S29, however, is no longer present after moving to Massey's for testing late Thursday evening, as seen from this ground shot I took at Massey's on Friday the 22nd. Note how smooth these tiles are compared to previous ships. Additionally, S29's lifting points were covered up meaning SpaceX probably plans to use a two-point lifting jig to lift future ships onto the suborbital pads for static fire testing, as opposed to the five lifting nights which had to be removed and toweled over after testing. Back inside the high bay, the stacking of S31 continues. Here we can see the midlock section entering the bay on Friday morning, where it will soon be lifted onto the turntable to be welded onto the stack. Before moving on to the star factory, Let's stop at the ring yard to see the S24.2 payload bay test article, as well as an assortment of S31 and B13 tank sections. Moving over to the lot which previously housed tents 1 and 2, crews appear to have finished the removal of concrete and are now preparing for star factory expansion in this direction. Zooming in, it appears that PVC piping has already been laid down. We can get a sense of just how tall the nose cone section of the factory will be by taking a look at this ground photo and some footage I captured of crews installing roof supports. The wall panels on the side of the Star Factory are progressing nicely, 
and it still looks like SpaceX plans to build around the plot of land they don't own, which has been boxed in by the Star Factory and tons of steel. Last we heard, a jury trial is due to occur in December 2023 to settle the dispute. If you've enjoyed this video so far, don't forget to like this video and hit the subscribe button down below for more Starbase news. And that'll do it for the build site this week. Of course, we've saved the best for last, so don't go anywhere just yet. At last, we arrive at the launch site, the home of the world's most powerful rocket. And for those of you who are new to Starship and Super Heavy launch system, check out this map to familiarize yourself with the different areas around the site. Before we get started, take a look at this picture from last Thursday's flyover. Now let's compare it with the picture from Wednesday, September 20th to compare the changes. Getting started on the suborbital side, we see that crews have begun the process of raising the grade of this dirt lot now that the new concrete wall on the edge of the property is complete. Taking a closer look at the left side, we can see that geotextile fabric has been laid out to provide soil stabilization, which is important as they build out the site for future use. Towards the center of the area, we see a convoy of belly dumpers depositing dirt as they make the rounds to create mounds for crews to level out. Using a belly dumper greatly reduces the amount of time and effort required to spread the loads of dirt in comparison to traditional dump trucks. But what about the trenches we saw here last week? Based on this image, it's as if they never existed. Unfortunately, we were unable to catch a glimpse of what, if anything, went inside the trenches before they were covered. Shifting over to Pad B, we can see that S26 has been freed up from the grasp of the LR11000 crane, meaning workers no longer require access to the interior of the vehicle. Hopefully this is a sign we are getting closer to some sort of static fire testing as it already underwent cryogenic proof testing back in February. Shifting over to a deluge tank farm, we can see a new parking lot has managed to stay organized after one week in use. Let's hope it stays that way. At the high pressure gas tank stacks, we can see the single 2x4 tank stack on the ground is still waiting for installation after nearly a month now. This seems to indicate the connections of all the new stacks on this end remains incomplete. If we zoom in to take a closer look in front of the gas distribution manifold, we can see the pump that the water trucks connect to for offloading into the system. There are multiple hookups so more than one truck can offload at the same time, which feeds into the pump and is then distributed via this pipe into the storage tanks. Since this image of the tanks was taken, crews have removed the scaffolding surrounding the large storage tanks, as seen in this ground photo. This is a good sign that the water-cooled steel plate system is closer to completion. Do you think we'll see another test prior to IFT2? Let me know in the comment section down below. Just above the tanks, the pad that was being prepared last week has since been poured and quickly put to use. This was one of the last areas to remain uncovered by concrete since the flight back in April. Down at the water retention pond, we can see a Movac water tanker in the process of removing residual water for processing. If we go north to the tank farm expansion area, we can see more concrete work underway. Based on the location of the cuts that have been made, we have a few theories for what is planned here. One theory is that this may be the future location of additional offload points for the new tanks after they've been installed. This could be a risky location as this is right in the path of the exhaust plume during the static fires and launches. Another theory is this could be a future berm. Once the new tanks are installed, we know they will need protection from exhaust and exhaust driven projectiles during firing and launch activities. An extension of the large berm in front of the tall storage tanks could be in the works. Just above this area near the exit of the launch complex, we can see a trailer loaded with Fondag. If this is being staged for outbound transportation, does that mean the excavated holes by the OLM have now been filled again for good? Stay tuned to find out. So what's going on at the tank farm anyway? Up top, we can see a Movac tanker offloading water for the fire egg system used under the OLM and the firefighting sprinklers located near the rear pipe rack behind the vertical tanks as seen here. It's not easily visible on the methane side of the tank farm, but here on the lock side we can see plumbing work ongoing for the newly installed hippos. These manifolds added underneath supply the liquid nitrogen used for subcoiling the propellants. At last, we arrive at the orbital launch pad. Before looking at the area immediately surrounding the OLM, I want to show you something that caught my eye down at the locks retention pond. Along the wall bordering the wetlands, it looks like metal railings or shielding is being added. This could likely be additional protection for the top of the wall surrounding the pad to prevent damage from flying debris. Just to the left of this location, we can see from the ground where someone took a bite from the wall not long ago. I'm not too certain this row would have stopped whoever got that hungry, but nonetheless, protecting the thinner and more fragile upper lip of the wall isn't a bad idea. So about those spots that needed Fondag, it looks like they were filled in yet again. 
what looks like burlap has been laid over the top of the freshly poured cutouts to aid with curing. This location closer to the berm we saw being cut last week has been repaired as well. This looks to have been a simple pull-up and put-down replacement job. Back over at the edge of the pad just beside the old lamb, we can see more cameras have been mounted for use with the next launch. Seen better in this ground photo, it looks like these could provide some interesting footage on liftoff. Let's hope they survive this time. One change we couldn't see from the air was this new walkway coming off the east-facing staircase. This is another access point for workers to get to the maintenance platform when it's raced under the OLM. We'll finish out today's video with a bit of a shocker. What you see here is in fact the hot stage ring from the top of B9. Not long after disconnecting from S26 on Wednesday, the LR11000 went for a stroll to the OLIT where it reached over S25 and hovered above the booster. You can see the lift, hook, raise, and lower it multiple times here. Little did we know this was a practice attempt to verify the crane could reach the hot stage ring without having to move S25. Shout out to Epic Spaceflight's Hoop Cam for capturing this great footage of the removal. This removal helps crews to perform inspections on harder to reach equipment as they can only access the avionics, Griffin motors, and certain other components without the hot stage ring present as they are stored on the forward dome. And that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Starbase Flyover Update. Today's video was sponsored by me. If you want to support our weekly flyovers, consider subscribing to our Patreon where you'll get access to our exclusive flyover gallery and other cool perks. If that's not in your budget, consider showing your support by buying some of the RGV Aerial Photography merch. We got some really awesome designs for you to check out. The link is in the description down below. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next week.